Good morning. Welcome. As we gather on this Lord's Day to praise the one who is worthy, our Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are delighted to sing praise to him and to hear his word. We want to extend a warm welcome to those who come as visitors today. May the Lord bless you here in the midst of worship. If you are a visitor with us, we invite you to notice in the bulletin the uh, words concerning the Lord's Supper that we plan to celebrate this morning. Uh, It's our understanding as the uh, leadership, the elders in this church, that the Lord's Supper um, is to be administered to the professing members of this congregation and uh, to those who are professing faithful members of another congregation. So if um, if you're a visitor and like to join us, we would ask if you would carefully consider the criteria printed there. Um, Number one, have you been baptized in the name of uh, the Father, Son, and Spirit? Number two, have you repented of your sins sincerely and made a public profession of your faith? Number three, are you desiring, are you seeking to live a godly Christian life? And number four, are you a member in good standing of a Bible-believing, Christ-preaching church? If if that's not your status at the moment, we would ask you just to pass the wine and bread on down the the row. But if uh, you meet all those criteria and you'd like to join us in the Lord's Supper, we invite you to join us. The Lord calls us to worship in these words of Psalm 105. Let's listen carefully as the Holy God summons us. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among all the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Let's come before God in silent prayer and ask for his blessing. It's our joy to stand before our God and to receive not a word of condemnation, but a word of gracious greeting, congregation of Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing with all of our hearts number 103E, rendition E, Psalm 103, rendition E, O come my soul, bless thou the Lord. 103E, and we'll sing the five stanzas.
The Lord our God has called us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are to love him and no other gods. We are to use his revelation, his name, with honor and reverence. We are to to worship him in the way that he commands. We are to honor him on his day and set it apart. And then we're also to, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And Romans 12 impresses that upon the church, calling us to, well, let me read these opening two verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, the will of God. He goes on at verse 9 to say, Romans 12, let love, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's bow before God and acknowledge our sins, not only against our God and against our neighbor in the world, but even our failures towards one another in the church. We bow together. O Lord our God, you have said through the prophet Isaiah, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. O Lord, we forget what a holy and a righteous God you are. As we come before you and your law, we recognize that we do not meet its requirements. We have fallen short of the glory of God. We have failed to give the perfect love towards you and neighbor, towards you and our brother and sister that your law requires. We acknowledge that, O Lord, and we pray for your forgiveness. We thank you that in Jesus Christ, the wrath of God does not await us, but day of judgment has already come at the cross. And Christ has borne the fierceness, the justice, the righteous wrath of the holy God in our place. So, Father, we pray, give us humble hearts that we would be able to see our sin, our sins against you, our failure to love you as we should, to give you ourselves, to desire you and your kingdom as we ought. Show us, Lord, our sins also against one another, even in the church, where we have failed to love one another in all the ways your word requires, to serve each other with the kind of joy and gladness and willing heart that you want for us. Forgive us also, Lord, as we and the world have often been bent towards vengeance. We have not given over the wrongs of others to you, but we have wanted to take matters in our own hands. Teach us, O Lord, your way. We pray that you would cleanse us of all of our sin, and that you'd assure us that in Jesus Christ is all the righteousness that we need. Hear us, most merciful God, for the sake of of the Lord Jesus, and in his name, amen. Let's sing as a song of penitence, number 86B, Lord, my petition heed, number 86B in the 
Trinity Psalter hymnal, and we'll stay seated for this one, and we'll sing just the first three stanzas, 86B stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Prophet Isaiah says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. What a gracious God we have. All who call upon him in the name of Jesus Christ are forgiven of all their sins. Let's bow before our God in prayer. O oh, great and holy God in heaven, we bow before your throne, acknowledge that you are not only holy and righteous, but you are a God of incomprehensible love and extraordinary mercies. Father, you've given to us your own beloved Son as our mediator, and in his name we seek to approach you. We pray your spirit would lead us to your throne by true faith, that we would believe that you and Jesus Christ, through your Son, have become our God and our Father, and that you are more willing to give us all that we need than the best of earthly parents. Well, Father, we thank you for the clear and resounding invitations of your word to come to the waters, those who have no money to come and buy and eat. Well, Father, we come to you with no money. We have no righteousness of our own. We have we have nothing that would compel you to act towards us, but we have the name of the Lord Jesus. We have the invitation of your own beloved Son. We have his death for our sins. We come to you, Father, through Christ. We pray that you'll receive us and that you would cause us to know your name and its glory and to worship you for the wondrous things that you have done. We acknowledge that there is no name like your name. Help us, God, to see the mighty works of God and to praise you. We worship you in the theater of this vast creation. We thank you for the sunshine and that radiant ball of energy that's sustained by your hand. We thank you, Lord, for the beauty that surrounds us as we live in the Pacific Northwest. We praise you for the ocean waters and for the boundary that you have laid at the coast and said to the ocean this far, but no farther. Father, we thank you that you are teaching us to, to know you through your word to love you and to adore you and worship you. We long that all men would praise you, that the earth would be covered with the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that all of creation would sing your praises, that we join them 
that the angelic beings would glorify you and that we'd be lifted up, that the saints above and the saints below might be one in praise of your kingdom. We thank you, God, for the Lord Jesus, for the great king you've given to us. We long that his perfect rule would more and more come into our hearts, that his perfect peace would triumph over the chaos of sin that has affected our minds and our hearts and our emotions, our wills, and all of our bodily activity. Father, we thank you you have not left us to that chaos, but you have visited us with the Spirit who brings order and peace. We pray that he would guide us in your will and in your way, that our minds would be truly transformed and not conformed to this world. We pray that your kingdom would grow today through the preaching of the gospel, both in our hearts and in the hearts of those who have not yet bowed to Jesus Christ. We pray that the scepter of Christ would be lifted high, that the mighty spirit would would show people their sin and bring them low, and that Jesus Christ would conquer. We pray that you would bless your word as it's preached in Italy. We pray for Reverend Brown and Reverend Ferrari as they labor there. We pray you'd bring a great reformation to a land of Roman Catholicism, and that the gospel of true grace would be declared, and that those who have lived in fear without assurance of salvation would at last discover a righteousness complete in Christ, received by faith alone. Bless our brothers, strengthen them and their families, provide all of their needs, bring people to come and hear the gospel, provide office bearers to serve, and let the congregations there grow in the depth of the truth of your word. Father, may we ourselves be about joyful obedience, doing your will. We pray you would Train us in that way. Where sin has appeared so much more pleasurable and desirable to us than obedience, we pray that you would change us. Where grumbling and discontent has has been our attitude, we pray that you would redeem us and make us willing servants. Father, we pray that you would sustain us with our daily bread. We are flesh, and we pray that you would give to us all that we need for our service here below. Lord, we pray that you would bless us with work, and that you would prosper it, and that you'd meet all of our needs, that you would help us with bills and with finances and with health. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our dairy farmers and for this labor that it would provide for their families. We pray for those facing difficult decisions in the area of their farms and businesses, that you would guide them and help them. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those who have been injured or sick and cannot be about the work they desire, we pray that you'd bring healing to them. Lord, you know we have many in need of your healing grace. We lift up to you, Greg, and we pray that you'd keep him from further obstructions, and that you would bless the cancer treatment he's under. And for Jim, we pray that you'd mitigate his pain and that you'd make effective the treatment he receives. And for Frank, we pray, Lord, that you bless the dialysis, but that you might also give his kidneys to be restored to function, and that you be near to him as he continues with other health concerns. Give, Lord, to these and to their spouses continued faith. Preserve that faith and make it strong for this day of trouble. Show them your mercy. We pray, Lord, for others who are recovering, for others who are at home sick and not been able to worship here with us, We pray that you'd extend, Lord, your grace and healing mercies to them. Father, we lift up to you our little ones. We thank you for the little ones in the womb. We pray you'd bless Terry and Jeremy and the the little ones in the womb, that you would give to them health and development, that you'd give Terry the strength that she needs. We pray, Lord, for Stephanie and for Aaron as they look forward to a delivery day. Be merciful, God, we pray. Watch over their child in the womb And we pray, Lord, that you bring forth your perfect timing, that you bring forth a child in good health under your watchful care, a delivery. We thank you, O Lord, for the mercies you've shown. We pray you'd continue that. Father, we lift up to you our shut-ins. We pray that you remember Susie and the rehab facility. Encourage her and heal her. You'd be near to Flora and to Joyce. We pray for Bernie and the pain that he suffered and unable to gather with us in worship. We pray you would encourage him and care for him. We thank you, Lord, for the home you provided for Alice and for blessing her move. We pray you'd bless her in her new place of residence 
and that you'd work all things there for her good. Father, we thank you for the family that we have in the Lord Jesus, and that we might encourage each other. Lord, we pray for those who are near and for those who are far away, for those traveling, for those sick at home, for those off at school. Oh Lord, you know all the needs, all the joys, and all the sorrows of your people. We pray that you would shepherd each of your people. For those, Lord, who have lost interest in worship, we pray that you would bring to their conscience today that great sense of conviction that you are worthy of worship and that there is no joy or happiness outside of your presence. Grant to each of your people that desire to live quorum Deo before the face of God. We pray, Lord, that you would keep us from wavering or from wandering, and where we do that you would pull us back. Forgive us, Lord, all of our sins and make us a forgiving people. May we find in the body of Jesus Christ those who forgive as they've been forgiven by Lord, the Lord. And may that then, Lord, when we stumble, help us to be able to return without fear, knowing that in the hearts of your people is manifest the grace of God. We thank you, Lord, that we may struggle together as we march towards that great day of full deliverance. We pray you'd protect us for that day, and that you would keep us and you would guard us from the evil one. We pray to bless our office bearers in their great and enormous tasks that you've laid upon them. O oh Lord, we are weak, but you are mighty. Supply your church also, we pray, with future office bearers. We pray that you would guide the council and the congregation in the hearts of men who are asked to serve, that you would bring forth more, Lord, who would serve offices of elder and deacon. We lift up to you, Lord, those who visit with us on this Lord's Day and other Lord's Days. Lord, though we do not know them well, perhaps we know that you do. We pray you'd be at work in their lives, whatever their needs are, but above all, blessing them with the need we all have, with the gospel of the Lord Jesus, with the covering of our sin, with the grace of the new heart and a new obedience. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. We pray, Lord, also for our nation, and for those in civil authority over us, rule over them, that your church might be able to live in peace and godliness. Protect our land from terrorist attacks, we ask, and from all forms of wickedness. We pray, Lord, that you turn away the hearts of this land from lawlessness, from violence in the womb, and violence upon the streets, and violence in the homes. Oh God, there is so much betrayal, so much selfishness. We pray, Father, that your gospel would permeate our culture here, that your church would be a bright light and proclaim the truth. Let every church turn today to your word and bow before it. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray all of these things and all God's people say, amen. This time, the offerings are received for the Benevolent Fund.
you turn to number 361 in the songbooks, that Easter day with joy was bright, 361. I'm not sure if we've sung this much, but uh, I think we can do it as we look towards John 11 where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. 361, we'll stand to sing the four stanzas. Would you turn with me in the gospel to uh, John chapter 11 as we continue our study there? The minister faces the question when coming to a chapter like this, whether to break it up into several sermons or to try to take it all at once. If you do the latter, of course, then you cannot go into every detail, and I've chosen to do the latter, so I like to read the whole chapter and then to try to preach it as a whole. John chapter 11. John 11, at verse 1, we hear the very word of God. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. 
So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Then Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on they plotted to put him to death. Therefore Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, And there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. So far, God's holy, infallible word. Let's bow before the Lord and ask him for his blessing. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your revelation. 
through your inspired word. And we pray now for the spirit who wrote these words to make them a living word as we hear them preached, working upon our hearts, strengthening our faith, and showing us Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Well, Congregation of Christ, this is a, obviously a deeply moving episode here, a very graphic encounter here. Jesus Christ, the good shepherd of John 10, now showing himself in all of his love and mercy and power. And, and we're thankful, aren't we, to God the Holy Spirit that he has seen fit to record this for us and to record it in such detail we have here Mary and Martha and Lazarus, three siblings, a couple sisters and a brother who, who clearly love each other deeply. They live together in Bethany, a, a village outside of Jerusalem, and, and they clearly love Jesus. They, well, John tells us that this Mary is the famous Mary, the one who anointed Christ's feet and, and wiped them with her hair, the thing we're going to read about in the next chapter of John, but she's already known to everybody John's writing to. And these three love Jesus, and Jesus loves them. And so his, his work here, his miracle here, is not to somebody he hasn't met before or hasn't met him, but he is, he's busy in the life of a family to whom he's closely connected, it seems. And yet as we see this rather poignant scene of pastoral care here, we have to keep in mind the big picture as well, that there's something going on here that's that's propelling Christ towards the cross at this point. At the end of John 10, Jesus is actually back where he started. He's near the Jordan River where John had been baptizing, and that's where Christ began his ministry. He was baptized there. He started there, and at the end of John 10, he's back there, and yet there's so much left undone. He has not confronted our chief enemy, death. He has not endured the great hostility of, of the Jewish leaders. Things are not yet finished. And now when Jesus in John 11 goes and raises Lazarus from the dead, the, the scene accelerates here now towards the cross. Things are propelled forward here by what Jesus does. And Jesus is both in this episode revealing who he is, that he has come to conquer our great, great enemy. And he has come to do that by laying down his own life for our sins. It's an amazing and wonderful thing. That Christ comes to conquer death because we live every day in the shadow of death, don't we? we? We hate death. Death is a monster. Death is is a great intrusion into this world. It has tentacles that that reach out, and we never know where death will take hold. We live in a world of sorrow. We are always threatened by the impending presence of death, and when it when it strikes, then it brings grief. It, tears families apart. It, it made Mary and Martha weep. It made Jesus weep. And yet, Hebrews 2 tells us that the Son of God came in our nature to set us free from the enslaving fear of death that held us in bondage. Because of our sin, because of the curse of death, we were held in bondage to death and the fear of death. And Christ has come to set us free so that we don't need to be afraid even of death. As Christ raises Lazarus from the dead, he is revealing who he is and what he has come to do, and he's propelling his own life towards the cross to redeem us. Let's look at this this morning. I'd like to consider, first of all, how Christ approaches Lazarus' grave. Jesus is a ways away and gets a message, an urgent message from Mary and Martha. Look, at our, our brother, the one you love, is sick. And you can, you can hear in their message their urgency, their desperation. And Jesus doesn't make clear what he's going to do, but he makes this statement in verse 4 that this sickness is not unto death, but to the glory of God and the glory of the Son of God. And so Christ is, is, is saying that death is not going to have the final word here. Death will not be the last word. He has a, a special purpose, however, and he doesn't go running off to save Lazarus from death. He stays where he is, and he lets death do its work. He lets the arms of death grab hold of Lazarus, that the glory of God might be revealed. And when he finally comes then to Bethany, Martha meets him outside of 
the village and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But, but I know that whatever you ask of God, he'll do. And Jesus said, your brother's going to rise. And she says, why? I believe in the resurrection of the body on that last day. I, I believe the prophets. I believe a day is coming when, when all God's people will rise from the dead. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The last day has come. I am here, the Son of God who has come to, to defeat death. It's an amazing statement, right, for Christ to say, I am the resurrection and the life. That, that the victory over death is not a medical breakthrough. It's not a prescription drug. It's not a, 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 a substance. The victory over death is a person. I am the resurrection. I hold the power of life. I possess the keys of life and death. Don't, don't merely look to a coming day of resurrection, but look to the one who is the resurrection. This, is, I think, is the fifth I am statement in the Gospel of John. And in some ways, it's the greatest one of all. I am the resurrection and the life. You know, death is not just that we stop breathing. Death is the enemy behind every enemy. Death has brought sickness and disease and marital conflict and murder. Behind our worries and anxieties is death. Behind our anger and dirty thoughts is death. Death is separation from God. It's it's the life, it's the sorrows apart from God. Christ says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Christ is saying in this world of death, I am the resurrection and the life for all who will trust in me, for all who will believe in me. This saving power of God come from heaven into this graveyard of planet earth is for those who will trust in me, who will believe on me. And then Martha makes the most extraordinary confession, one of the greatest confessions in all of Scripture. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into this world. I believe that you are the meaning of history, that you are God's visitation upon a broken planet, that that you are the answer to all of the world's troubles, that, that you are the only life there is in a whole planet of death, You are God come to save us. Extraordinary confession. That this is God's beloved son. And then she calls for her sister Mary. And Mary comes running. And with her all these Jews who have been comforting her. What What a marvelous scene that these two sisters and their weeping are surrounded by. By all these others who are mourning with them. We know something of that today too, don't we? In the body of Jesus Christ, the, the wonder and the beauty of, of those who stand beside the one who is grieving. And, and where have we learned to do that? But from Jesus, who even weeps at the tomb, who, who weeps with those who weep. He has taught us that it's good to surround those who are grieving and to seek to encourage them and to carry them, even though we often say, I don't know what to say. And yet the very presence of And God's people with God's people is a joy and a help. And she comes to Jesus too, looking for him, hearing from him. And Jesus comes as the Savior that we so desperately need. Jesus sees her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping and he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Those are, those are extraordinary words. Originally, it comes from the idea of snorting, like an animal that snorts. It came to mean anger and, and that's probably more the sense here. He groaned in the spirit. He was, he, he was moved to indignation and anger. And, and some commentators, well, what's he angry at? Is he angry at Mary and these women for weeping instead of believing? Well, no, he's, he's angry. He's, he's vexed by 
death in his creation. I mean, imagine if you went back to a house you used to own and you had beautiful gardens that you had taken care of and you had planted all these plants and you had nurtured them and it was picture perfect when you left and you returned to your home and you see what the homeowners have done now it's been seven years and it's a disaster you think what a what a waste what have they done but it's far more than that when the great gardener when the creator the lord jesus has come into this world had been a paradise And he sees the consequences of our sin and rebellion. He sees this this weeping, this sorrow, the misery. He sees what death has done. Sometimes there's anger at funerals, right? If somebody young has died. Even at unbelieving funerals, you find people are angry. Why did this happen? Death, I hate death. But even as Christians, right? Not in a unbelieving way but there's a believing way in which we too we say I hate death or we see a disease somebody has and we say I hate that disease or we look at warfare across the globe this morning and orphan children and weeping wives and soldiers missing limbs and we say I hate war well here the son of God has come to visit his creation He grieves and he hates the devastation of death, the ravages of sin. And his heart surges with intense emotion here. Calvin makes a good point that he comes to the grave here not as a spectator. Not as a spectator. He comes to the grave as a wrestler who is preparing for battle. He snorts. He gets angry. He, like a soldier going to battle, and he looks across the field and sees the one who destroyed some other village or town, and he's angry, and he wants to deal with it. He's determined. And he asks where he's laid, and, and they say, come and see. And then we read John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Which the boys and girls might remember as the shortest verse in the Bible. But the older you get, the more you remember it as the most amazing verse, right? That... The very eternal Son of God, come in our nature, is willing to weep. That he so involves himself, he so participates with us in the brokenness of this world. He doesn't stand aloof in heaven somewhere, unconcerned. He has come so close to us that as he sees the women weeping, and faces the loss of his friend Lazarus, he weeps king what a glorious king what a world has opened up to us here to the very heart of our shepherd king to the very heart of our savior whenever we feel that that christ is somehow distant from us or he's unconcerned or he he stands apart and doesn't know what i'm suffering this is a good verse to go to isn't it creator who made it all and watched us destroy it all has come all the way to stand next to us at a grave and to weep in our sorrows. So there is, as Christ approaches this grave, there's this sovereign delay. He waits on purpose for Lazarus to die. And then there's this bold proclamation, I am the resurrection and the life. And then there's this profound compassion that he weeps But then let's look secondly this morning at what Christ does at the grave, his triumph over the grave. He tells him to take away the stone. And what's Martha's reply? She says, it's going to stink. Four days. It's decay. She wants to protect Jesus from the stench of death. Having no idea, he's going to go a lot farther than to smell death. But her words reveal our powerlessness, don't they? Our powerlessness in the face of death. We, we can't even take away the smell of death. I mean, we're thankful for funeral directors and all that they do. Make a 
visitation, a funeral, a more pleasant encounter, but we can't even take away the smell of death. We live in a culture that spends all of its time and money trying to cover it up, right? Trying to make things look better than they are, trying to paint a new facade, trying to deal with all the the outward consequences and symptoms of a far deeper trouble, death. And in the face of this utter helplessness of humans, of Martha and Mary and you and me, Christ comes forward with fearless determination, take away the stone. Meet a good doctor, and you're cringing. Got your child bandaged up in the doctor's office, and he says, take off the bandage. You think, ah. But the doctor's got the skill. He's not afraid. Christ the fearless one, open the tomb. Let death and all its power and stench stand before me, and I will answer it. O oh, death, where were you when I made man good and in my own image? O oh, death, where will you be? What will you be when, when I defeat the penalty, the penalty of sin and carry away the sins of my people? O oh, death, where will you be when I rise triumphant from the grave? Death, stand before me and I will question you. Christ gives a loud command. Lazarus, come forth. It's not a soft whisper. Not a, hey, buddy Lazarus, what do you think about coming out? This is a royal command, a summons. And these words of Christ, they echo through this dark, cold chamber where death has been laughing. And they invade the realm of the enemy with the power of life. Lazarus begins to breathe. His impulses are returned. His decaying flesh is renewed and he rises and he comes out. Grave clothes still wrapped around him. The mummy out of the tomb at the voice of Jesus. Jesus had said in John 5, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice, my voice, And come forth. Jesus had said to Martha that he who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. We may die physically, we will die physically if Jesus does not return first, but we possess a life that can't be taken away. We have an existence with God, a communion with the living God, and we won't lose it even at the point of death. We will transition. From earth to heaven, we, our soul will, will leave our body. But our fellowship with God, our life in God, will not for a moment go out of existence. And death now becomes the passageway into heaven. That's true for all those who have experienced the first resurrection in this life, right? Ephesians chapter 2, and you, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. You were spiritually dead, and at the voice of Jesus, you rose. That's what we call the efficacious call of the gospel, irresistible grace, that in the the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, our dead heart came to life, and we live now, and therefore death has not power over us. The same mighty word that called Lazarus out of that tomb is the mighty word that called us out of our spiritual graves. What a glorious Savior. What a mighty power over death. And all of this a revelation, isn't it, of the power that Christ will obtain by his own death and resurrection. But that's going to cost him something. And that brings us to our third point this morning, the substitution within the grave, the substitution within the grave. This miracle now becomes the occasion for the the leaders of Israel to, to meet as a council together and to set in motion a plan to murder Jesus. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that by raising Lazarus from the dead, he had thrown down the gauntlet. He had 
crossed the Rubicon. He had come into a situation from which now there is no turning back. He has, he has struck the beehive. And, and things are going to go from, from bad to worse, outwardly speaking. Jesus wanted that. Because actually there is no resurrection for Lazarus here or on the last day without Christ moving forward to the cross. Because the the resurrection power that Christ is displaying back here is actually flowing backward in time from the grave of Jesus, isn't it? In other words, if if Christ was not going to go to the cross and rise from the dead, he would not have been able to raise Lazarus. Now, Caiaphas says, you know, it's better. Caiaphas, the high priest, says it's better that one dies for the nation than that we all die. Don't want the Romans coming in here, all the people getting stirred up, and the Romans will put us down and we'll, we'll lose our freedoms. And then the Holy Spirit tells us something in John eleven fifty one 51, that Caiaphas did not say this on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Caiaphas unwittingly is proclaiming the truth that Christ will die for the people. Caiaphas thinks it's a matter of elimination, and the Holy Spirit tells us it's a matter of substitution. Caiaphas thinks it's we're getting rid of this malicious weed, and the Spirit is telling us that this is the very seed of of salvation here. You see, whatever Christ gives to us, brothers and sisters, whatever Christ gives to you, he gives up for himself. It always costs him. If our thirst is quenched, then it means he was thirsty at the cross. If if we are healed, then it means he bore our sicknesses. If, if our tears are going to be wiped away, it's because he shed tears. If, if we are forgiven, it's because he was condemned. If we are made alive, it's because he died. If Lazarus is going to come out of this tomb, then it's because Jesus Christ will go into the tomb. But there is no salvation without the payment for sins. Death is not a beautiful, natural thing. The world can keep trying to pretend it's just part of this wonderful cycle of existence that things live and die and blah, blah, blah. We know from the Bible that death came into the world through sin, through our rebellion. It's the curse of God. And the only way to deal with death is to remove the curse of God. The power of death is sin. Christ has come to deal with death at the root level. This is the amazing thing, that by Christ springing Lazarus from the grave, Christ is driving himself into the grave so that he might rise again and be able to give us life. Lord's Day 16 says our, our death, our death now, is not a payment for our sins, but only a dying to sins and an entering into eternal life. Lord's Day 22, not only will my soul be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head, but also my very flesh, raised by the power of Christ, will be reunited with my soul and made like Christ's glorious body. 1 Corinthians 15, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we bow before so great a Redeemer. His sovereign authority, His profound compassion, His willingness to take our place in the grave, our place beneath your wrath on the cross. Oh God, we stand amazed. 
that the Son of God, the creator of heaven and earth, would stoop to this. Bring us now to the table, we pray, that we might dine with our living Lord Jesus, and that he might minister to us not only his grace through the word we've heard preached, but his grace through the visible word of the sacrament. Thank you, God, for such a Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to take out the Forms and Prayers book and to turn for the form, to the form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper on page 50. Page 50. It's celebration of the Lord's Supper, short form number one, page 50. These words addressed to the professing members of this church and faithful members of other churches. To all of you who have with godly sorrow confessed your sins and who have affirmed true faith in Christ, the promise of Jesus is sure. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. For the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. While remaining bread and wine, these sacred elements nevertheless become so united to the reality they signify and that we do not doubt but joyfully believe that we receive in this meal by the Spirit, through faith, nothing less than the crucified body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. For all who live in rebellion against God and in unbelief, this holy food and drink will bring you only further condemnation. If you do not confess Jesus Christ and seek to live under his gracious reign, we admonish you to abstain. But all who repent and believe are invited to this sacred meal, not only, excuse me, not because you are worthy in yourself, but because you are clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. Do not allow the weakness of your faith or your failures in the Christian life to keep you from this table, for it is given to us because of our weakness and because of our failures in order to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As the word has promised us God's favor, so also our heavenly Father has added this confirmation of his unchangeable promise. So come, believing sinners, for the table is ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's bow together. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the blood of your only begotten Son has secured for us a new and living way into the Holy of Holies, Cleanse our minds and hearts by your word and spirit, and that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through this holy sacrament, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity through the body and blood of Christ our Savior. We know that our ascended Savior does not live in temples made by hands, but he's in heaven, and there he continues to intercede on our behalf. Father, through this sacrament and by your own word and spirit, I pray you would now set these common elements of bread and wine apart from ordinary use and consecrate them to be used by you so that just as truly as we eat and drink these elements by which our bodily life is sustained, so truly may we receive into our souls for our spiritual life our Lord Jesus Christ. We receive these gifts by faith, which is the hand and the mouth of our souls. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand together that we might, coming as one body, believing the same thing, might recite the Apostles' Creed together. Congregation of Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The elders are invited to come forward. People of God, let us now go to our heavenly table and receive the gift of God for our souls. By the promise of God, this bread and wine are for us the body and blood of Christ. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. People of God, the bread which we break is a communion of the body of Christ. People of God, take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. The cup of blessing for which we give thanks is a participation in the blood of Christ.
people of God, take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Let's bow in thanksgiving prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of this holy feast. We aren't worthy to share this meal with you and ourselves, but you have invited us and dressed us in Christ's righteousness. So boldly we call upon you and seek you in your holy of holies, expecting not your wrath but your pardon, rejoicing that the fear of death is removed and we've been given hope. We thank you for our great high priest, for our mediator of the new covenant, who has reconciled us to you and even now intercedes for us by his body that had been nailed to the cross, now before your face. Strengthen us to the risen Savior, that by these gifts, relying only on your gracious promises in the name of Jesus, we may be built up to live for your glory and honor forever. Hear us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing number 369 in response to God's grace to us. 369. doxology number 563 as the elders pick up the communion cups number 563 lift your hearts to God receive his blessing the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours now and forever amen